Hi, everyone. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. My name is Natalie Bell, and I'm the curator at the List Visual Arts Center at MIT. And together with the Contemporary Arts Center Cincinnati, we're really honored to be co-hosting um, this session. This is the third of eight virtual sessions on the subject of waiting. Um, and this is a program series that is convened by Avi Alpert and Rit Premneth of Shifter, uh, which is a print journal that Rit founded in 2004, uh, which explores the intersections of contemporary art, theory, and experimental writing. Uh, this series will result in an issue of Shifter that is similarly dedicated to the subject of waiting, uh, which Rit and Avi will be releasing next fall. And uh, I wanted to mention that the, the List Center and CAC um, came to partner on this program in conjunction with separate but jointly organized solo exhibitions that we're both hosting with Rit Premneth next year. And we look forward to sharing both of those with many of you as well. Um, I also want to add that for those of you who are new to the List Center or to CAC, uh, we'd like to give, give you an extra welcome and thanks for joining us um, and also encourage you to visit us online or on social media and learn more about our upcoming programs, uh, including the next of our Shifter series, which will be on November 12th. Uh, and lastly, this session is closed captioned and recorded and it will be archived in a couple of days along with the previous two sessions on uh, the List Center and CAC's YouTube. So that is uh, all for me and I'll pass it to you, Avi. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Natalie. Um, as Natalie mentioned, uh, my name is Avi Alpert. I'm the co-editor of Shifter with Rit Premnath. Um, thank you all so much for being here on this Thursday evening or whatever time it is where, where you are. Um, we just want to you know, start by saying some thank yous to Natalie Bell, who you just saw at MIT List Center, as well as Amara Antella at the Center, um, Contemporary Art Center, Cincinnati. I always get that order mixed up for organizing this and offering us the platform to, to do these conversations with you all. Um, and also thanks to a lot of the staff there, um, Emily Garner, who has been working with us to get this all set up and organized, um, as well as the IT people tonight, Nick Cardone, who's made this all very seamless, and the transcriber, Jamie Pellegrino. Um, Britt and I also just wanted to mention tonight, the we, we've been doing these, as, as Natalie mentioned, the Shifter Mixes kind of public discussion series uh, with the publication and often the publications come out, the last few issues, the publications have come out of our ongoing discussions. The previous iteration took place at Art in General in Brooklyn um, under the leadership of Laurel Patak, uh, who really guided and supported this program for two years. Um, as some of you may have heard or, or already know, Art in General uh, will be closing after four decades um, this year. So we just wanted to say thanks to Art in General for giving us that platform and especially to Laurel for helping us to develop this and, and bring us to this point. So I will um, pass along to Rit, who will say a little bit more specifically about what we're doing tonight, the, the waiting series, as well as introduce our speakers. Thanks, Avi. Um, hi, everyone. Um, waiting was a subject that, of course, is a subject that is, of course, on all of our minds as um, we put our lives on hold um, during COVID. Um, but waiting is also uh, a situation, a state of being that is enforced on many people, that is um, chronically the condition of people in certain, um, of certain ethnicities, of certain races, of certain nationalities that are seen as being um, in some moment of development perpetually, um, certain classes of people um, waiting is also um, uh, an activity, um, potentially, that we could argue that we're all in all the time, that we're all always in between um, a here and a there um, in a space of waiting. And so Avi and I really wanted to take this time, this time when we're all on hold, to think about the subject of waiting in, um, in, in a kind of broad and expansive way. Uh, we're really excited to have Sandrine Kanak and Felipe Steinberg present today. Um, after Sandrine and Felipe present for about 10 to 15 minutes each, we'll have time 
for um, conversation. And I encourage you to use the Q&A function in Zoom to um, ask questions or even just present comments or thoughts and Avi or I will, um, will read them out um, in, in this um, webinar. So uh, feel free to do that along the way or after the presentation. So um, I'm going to introduce um, uh, Felipe first um, and Sandrine second, and Sandrine will be the first to, to present tonight. So Felipe Steinberg is an interdisciplinary artist whose work enlists various types of media and systems of circulation to explore the thickness between social spaces and interpersonal encounters. Steinberg um, attended the Whitney Independent Study Program and the core program at the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. His work has also been presented in venues such as Museo Oscar Neymar in Curituba, Museo di Arte Mordana Aloisio Magales in Recife, Socrates Sculpture Park, New York, Anthology Film Archives, New York, Khalil Sakakani, Sakakini Cultural Center in Ramallah, Visual Arts Center, University of Texas in Austin, One After 320 in New Delhi, and SESC um, Ribiraun in Preto. Um, and Sandrine Kanak is an art historian based in Brooklyn. She graduated with a PhD in art history and criticism from Stony Brook University and was a Helena Rubinstein Fellow in Critical Studies, also from the Whitney Independent Study Program. Sandrine's article, Tell All the Truth, But Tell It Slant, Recovering the Presence of Angela Davis in Robert Barry's Marcusa piece, was recently published in the Oxford Art Journal. Her work attempts to rethink institutional modes of knowing and the ways in which art is written into history. So please join me in welcoming um, Sandrine. Hi. Um, so I am going to share my screen. Here we go. That works? I guess it does. All right. So thank you, um, Reed, for uh, the introduction and thank you all for being um, with us tonight. So as a way to introduce the project, I will be writing for Shifter, Shifter magazine, which I tentatively called The Waiting Boom. I will present two other projects, one recently published in the Oxford Art Journal and the other one currently in the works. As you will see, uh, in all three projects, I am trying to think of different ways about how history is written and about the relationship between the writing of history and fiction. So this uh, first project that I would like to discuss is uh, an article which is based on a chapter of my dissertation. And the title is rather long, so I'm just going to say, uh, tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Um, so this article revolves around this text piece by the American conceptual artist Robert, Robert Barry, known as the Marcuse piece, which he made in 1970. In this work, which reads some places to which we can come and for a while be free to think about what we are going to do, Barry's own words uh, meets Marcuse, or as I argue, words that invoke the invisible presence the political struggles and intellectual contributions of Angela Davis. So this article addresses a series of silences in Barry's work, in Marcuse's text, and in the Marcuse species interpretation. So for this piece, uh, Barry uh, chose a, a quote from the last paragraph of An Essian Liberation, a book written by the German philosopher and new left theorist, Herbert Marcuse. In this paragraph, Marcuse introduced an unnamed interlocutor, a young black girl, who responds to the question that has troubled the mind of so many men of goodwill, namely, what are the people in a free society going to do? Her answer, highlighted in this slide, which Barry went on to quote in his work is, for the first time in our lives, we shall be free to think about what we are going to do. So after reading this uh, paragraph, I started to wonder, who is this young black girl? Is she a fictional character? Is she a rhetorical device? Is she a real person? And why would Marcuse invoke her presence and relay her words as such a critical point of the essay? 
um, I answer this question in the article, but I also go on to explain why Marcuse erasure of Davis, like Barry's failure to identify Davis in Marcuse's essay, are not isolated instances, but evidences of a broader practice of epistemic violence against black thinkers by preeminent European philosopher. The Marcuse piece is thus an example of what feminist epistemologists have called epistemic oppression. The sustained exclusion of marginal subjects from the realm of knowledge production. In Marcuse's text, like in Foucault's or Deleuze, Black activists and thinkers remain anonymous because they are not valued enough to function as legitimate, legitimate sources and as such cannot fully participate in the production of knowledge they inspired. But now that we know uh, that Davis is a speaker, speaker of that quote, what does it mean for the interpretation of Barry's piece? Recovering Davis' presence bring to the fore political contexts such as the Black liberation and prison abolition movements rarely discussed in histories of conceptual art. Davis's work, most importantly, allows us to rethink the meaning of the pronoun we and the word free, both central to Barry's text piece. I conclude the article by asking if the circulation of Barry's piece then and now keeps the promise of freedom alive or if it exposes its inadequacy. I also ask if and how this piece should continue to be displayed in art exhibition. So the second project I would like to discuss, which is currently titled How to Talk with the Ghost, a fictional conversation with Susan Hiller deals with the work of the British American artist uh, Susan Hiller, who is best known for her para conceptual works, exploring repressed or, or fugitive states of human consciousness. Hiller coined the term paraconceptual in 1977 to describe materials and culture, cultural areas excluded by the first generation of conceptual artists, such as the spiritual, the paranormal, and the mystical what Hiller called the unconscious of culture. By excavating other modes uh, of knowledge and being in the world, her work performed a critique of traditional and sometimes oppressive notions of truth, reason, and objectivity. Hiller is also known for her writing on primitivism and ethnographic displays, such as this book um, called The Myths of Primitivism, she edited in 1991. However, this aspect of her practice has yet to inform discussion of how her work represented Western culture or into this term, how it racialized whiteness. Because in the process of re-enchanting Western culture by tapping into the paraconceptual, Hiller may have also made whiteness look exceptional, even supernatural. If whiteness is usually characterized as being unmarked, what are what are the consequences of marking it as extraordinary? Since unfortunately, um, I am not able to ask this question to Hiller, who passed away in 2019, I decided to write a fictional conversation consisting of my questions and responses to excerpt of interviews and talks Hiller gave over the course of her career. I chose this format because it no, it's not only well suited to Hiller's work, but also because it allows me to do three things. One, it allows me to move away from more tradi traditional forms of academic writing. Two, it allows me to grapple with the unstable frontier between fiction and nonfiction in the writing of history. And three, uh, it also speaks to art history relentless desire to converse with the past. And with that, uh, moving to this uh, last project, The Waiting Room, which I will be writing uh, for uh, Shifter. So when I came up with this idea of a fictional conversation with Susan Hiller, I was reading this book by the Indian historian Deepesh Chakrabarty, a founding member of the Subaltern Studies Editorial Collective. Among many other things in this book, uh, Chakrabarty makes a compelling critic of historicism. Historicism for him is this linear way of telling a history of the world that originates with and in Europe and then spreads outside of it to become global. 
um, this vision of history, Chagrabarty argues, has also been used time and again by colonial and neo-colonial nations as a justification to deny non-Western countries the right to self-govern. In such cases, excuses can be, um, you're not uh, democratic enough, you're not modern enough, you name it. You, you name it. Um, and to symbolize this idea of the not being there yet, uh, Chakrabarty claims that non-Western countries are permanently confined to the waiting room of history. And I guess now you're seeing me coming with putting all these pieces together. Um, and so for Shifter, I want to use this idea of a fictional conversation and take it a step further by writing a fictional conversation between Chakrabarty and others that take place in a waiting room. Because at the end of the day, having a discussion between authors moderated by a narrator is a fictionalized representation of what happens in any academic text. It's a conversation. It's a conversation in which the author slash narrator uses other people's work to build an argument. And as this is uh, still very much a work in progress, I thought I was going to leave you with some of the questions and problems that I'm trying to navigate and that maybe we could discuss during um, the Q&A. So in addition to having to think about the contents of this conversation, this format gives me the opportunity to think about my own place within this narrative. Who am I going to be? Am I going to be a secretary, a fly listening in and buzzing around the room? What is going to spark the conversation? An artwork on the wall, something reproduced on the cover of a magazine, or a book someone could be reading? What kind of waiting room am I going to be using? A dentist's waiting room is very different from a train station or an immigration office waiting room. Could it be an imaginary waiting room, like uh, some time of purgatory? And what would the waiting room of history look like if I were to describe it? Do I only use real people or should I fictionalize institutional role and have a gatekeeper, for instance? Um, how do I deliver this fictional conversation? Should I write a narrative? Should it be a script, uh, some kind of script? Um, and how can I make sure to provide agency to the reader's character? And lastly, but perhaps, perhaps most importantly, what should they all be waiting for? And how do they exit the waiting room? So this is where I'm at. Thank you. And I'm gonna stop sharing. Thank you, go. Sandrine. Felipe, would you like to? Yes, can you see me? Yes, we can see. Yes. Uh, I'll share my screen here in a moment. OK. So in the last few years, I've been working around issues of labor and labor representation. And I think for today, I'll not be able maybe to show my previous work, but I'll try to jump in right away in the project I proposed to Shifter. Uh, the, the premise of the, propo the proposal I made to Shifter was to look at a Supreme Court decision of 1944. This Supreme Court decision uh, is called like Skidmore uh, versus Swift & Co. Swift & Co was a meat packing industry in Fort Worth, Texas. And Skidmore is the last name of Gene Skidmore. That was a firefighter that was working for the company at the time. Skidmore and his co-workers in 1944, they went to court in Texas because they were claiming that it was true that the company hired them to be there for five days a week, but also they were asked without like being previously arranged that they should stay at work uh, for uh, during the night or the four days in the week. And what the company was doing was basically they were not paying for them while they they, there was no alarm. So basically they, the company claimed they would only be paid whenever alarm came out and the firefighters were called. On the company side, they claimed that that time was not of, uh, of work because the company provided amusements for them like a pool, a dominoes, or like air conditioning, heating system, and even beds for them to sleep. 
So what Jim Skidmore and his co-workers did, they went to court in Texas, but uh, at that court, they, they lose. And then they went to the Supreme Court to try to appeal for that. And the Supreme Court reversed the case, making them aware that like that waiting constituted work. So the, the document is kind of big. I'll not go through it. It's like a eight page. It's a kind of very interesting piece of literature as well. And I was like looking at some terminology in the document and I think I highlighted two parts here that I think I want to show and share that kind of regarding my concerns about what I'm trying to talk. So these, uh, they say facts may show that the employee was engaged to wait or they may show that he waited to be engaged. So I think all the court cases following this issue, they kind of try to frame the issue around this idea or either you are engaged to wait or you waited or you are waiting to be engaged and somewhat this will kind of lead the discussion of it constitute work or not other highlight i want to do is like in the end they concluded that the law does not impose an arrangement upon the parties it imposes upon the courts the task of finding what the arrangement was so in that sense, I think it's also important to highlight the fact that uh, of the, the, uh, the arrangement part is the focus of the, they didn't say what should be done, but they kind of just set the somewhat how the, some details, how could be approached the issue. So, this is one photo of the stockyard when a fire happened, I think from 1911, although the court case is from 1944. So now jumping abruptly, almost hundred years later, uh, the bridge I'm trying to build here and maybe that's what I'm trying to think today and uh, maybe for the project for a shifter is to look at that conditions of waiting in relation to the current conditions of waiting within the so-called global digital economy. If you guys are not familiar with this, this is a screenshot of the Mechanical Turk that is an Amazon a sort of workplace where you can be a requester or a worker. I myself worked there several times and like also this time I was trying to, to be on the side of the requester. So basically, if you're not familiar with this platform, it's basically what's called click working or crowdsourcing. So you can, as a worker, you can go through these long lists of opportunities and you have to kind of see if you have the certain skills to, to fulfill that opportunity. And also most of the time you have to think, okay, they're paying this amount. I might use 10 minutes, 20 minutes to do this. This is worth it. So the act of waiting is like an act of also looking for uh, an opportunity and trying to make all this math to see if it's worth it or not. Uh, so as you guys could imagine, it's a very precarious situation and labor condition, you know, psychologically and physically. So from what I know from the, the data that I have from about this, I, I get to know that 18% of the people that work here made this as their full-time jobs, although 82% use it as some kind of extra cash or somewhat like what's called it nowadays, some kind of play labor situation where you do, instead of watching TV, maybe you engage in this in your free time. So you make some extra cash. So this kind of comes as a leisure activity somewhat for some people. And I think what I've been exploring is like what people, how the people refer, how the works talk about themselves about this. And I've been interested very much in this community, which I'm part of in Reddit, it's called a Beer Money. And as the name says, like as a community that try to work around this idea of all these online opportunities where you can eventually make money, but not a money for a living, but does this extra cash as they say in the description of the community, Beer Money is a community for people to discuss mostly online making opportunities. You shouldn't expect to make a living, but it's possible to make extra cash on the site for your habits and needs. Um, 
So what I've been interested in these communities that like is a kind of solidarity in between the workers. And I think many times there is a lot of like uh, issues that I raise it and people kind of join together to kind of either boycott a certain platform or either is more a matter of community in terms of jokes. And sometimes these really different stuff happens there. And this slide I'm showing here, for example, is just showing that um, at some point someone got this photo in one of these platforms that's called Remo Test. And they told the worker, can you identify where are the fruits here? And if you see the photo, basically it's just an abstraction. So it's not possible to see anything. And then on the other hand, there is more issues re regarding the work conditions. So this is a topic that was very popular. And like, for example, if a survey is only looking for very specific users, they should find out right away, asking you to spend 20 minutes ranking different companies and then telling you, sorry, you don't qualify is a fraud. So I've been somewhat participating, kind of trying to understand the discourse that is built around this network of solidarity in between these beer money or beer workers. And um, okay, so perhaps what I'm trying to do here to shift there is to try to join this court case and this structure of current structures of labor. So what I did, I kind of got the, the, the court case, the Supreme Court case that I mentioned initially, and I summarized into one situation. And uh, this situation is like one sentence only, trying to, to say like what was the issue behind the, the, the waiting and working, if it is constitute work or not. So what I did, I, this time I went to Amazon Mechanical Turk as a requester. And I told, and I put the sentence for people to reply to them. And the sentence goes like this. Jean Skidmore and other employees of the Swift Company packing plant in Fort Worth, Texas, were all firemen who work at eight hours per week for which they were paid normally. They also spent four nights per week in the fire hall where they were on call in case of an alarm. However, they were only paid for time spent, sorry. However, they were only paid for time spent actually when responded to an alarm. The fire hall was equipped with heated and air conditioning sleeping quarters, along with equipment for various recreational activities, such as pool, dominoes, and etc. The firemen could sleep, play, or do anything as long as they were available, should there be an alarm. The firemen sued Swift and Company and argued that they should be compensated for the time spent in the fire hall, even when not directly answering an alarm. So the question I posed was, does the time the firemen spent in the fire hall waiting for an alarm constitute work? So I posed the same question that was asked to the Supreme Court, but this time in this kind of web forum sort of a labor hall. What I got back was like, uh, also I forgot to mention that apart from what I asked for, I was also, I also asked for people to submit a photo of the workstation. And uh, I'll not read all of them because I submit, I asked 20, I asked for 20 persons to respond. So I think this will stay in the video. So eventually, this can be seen later if you pause the video and you can read, but I'll, I'll read just two of them. So this one, for example, just have to, okay. So this is the workstation of this person and this person's opinion is, firemen should be paid for the time spending, spent waiting the hall. This is because they are there against their wish. They would otherwise be at their home, spending time with their family or doing whatever they wanted to do. They are in the hall to serve the company. Whether or not there is an alarm is not up to them. If company requires them to be in a hall rather than be at their own homes, then company should pay them for it. Payment can be less than what is given when they're responding to an alarm, but it should be there. So then I'll go, I'll skip quickly through the. So this is another submission as the workstation of the person and the answer, just to clarify, so I asked the answer, 
and also the work the workstation of the person. Is another one. This is one I wanted to read also, because I think, okay, I'll read first. As a libertarian, they shouldn't receive for those hours as they freely agreed with those terms and conditions. However, I think, yes, they are working and they're already being paid somehow because if they didn't accept the conditions, they wouldn't be earning the eight hours per week that are guaranteed. Yes, I think they, they, it may be a pretty bad job if there aren't many calls, but it was their choice nevertheless. They accepted. Uber drivers work on conditions that are worth having not in guarantee. They have to pay for the car, gas, those things, and aren't compensated for the waiting time. Same here on MTurk. So I think it, I will not, I don't have time to read everything, but this was the only one that I think referred to, to the job itself, to the mechanical Turk itself. And the others were just kind of somewhat addressing the issue from the perspective of the Supreme case, Supreme Court case. So this is another one, another workstation in the text, one more. So I kept, I didn't change anything. So this person wrote in all capital. This is another one, another one. This is pretty interesting because the same person submit the assignment two times with two different opinions and the photos were just slightly different. So it's the same table and chair, but if you notice the next slide, the person just changed it, closed the curtain and put some stuff on the table, but that's okay. One more and then this is another one. So I got 20 of them just to remember. And I'm almost over with this. And um, another workstation, another workstation. And this is the last one. So I think in the end, I was trying to look at this idea of a trial somewhat, of bringing the trial to the forum of the internet and somewhat like create this participation, propose this participation. And just to be clear, like how they participate, I think this is something fundamentally important for this project. So I have this, uh, so we are, we have the 250 from Shifter, that was the proposal. And I, what I did, I, just, I got 20 co-authors for this project and I divided all the 200 by then, so 10 each, I got 10 also, and $40 were just fees that Amazon took it. Just to clarify also that everybody knows that they would be part of this. I told them if they want to display their name, they could, but nobody wanted. Everybody's anonymous. And they were aware that that was a publication and they will be part of an online talk, that their content would be shown and published. So there was consent in all these spheres. And just to finish, I think what I've been trying to look in my work and in this issues regarding like uh, the what's global digital economy or like lay, online labor is that these possibilities of we looking at this precarity that's created for these workers. I think this is the very famous automaton. You might be familiar with that. Like, uh, so I'll explain briefly, but this basically uh, was a sort of a robot or a puppet that would play chess with an adversary and would always win. And when it, this was shown, people would think that perhaps there was really this magic happening where this sort of robot was winning. And, but in the end of the day, people find out that there was a person inside hidden puppeteering the thing. Although this story is very famous and in art even this was written a lot about, I think what I was interested in relation to my project is to look how this, the automaton was, the different renderings of the automaton here. One where the, everything is closed, so you don't see what's inside. The second image, you can see the structure or the guts of the machine, but you don't see the person hidden inside. And the third artist choose to depict the person that's inside and the person outside. So I think when we come into understand how labor or these conditions of online labor can be represented, I think 
these three options are kind of things that I've been thinking about, like how to approach this invisibility and bring it visible. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Felipe. Um, maybe we can, this is both, thanks so much to, to both of you for these um, really rich and evocative presentations that traverse so many different spaces and ideas and genres. Um, I thought maybe we could start just by opening um, this space for Sandrine, if you wanna reply to Felipe, Felipe to Sandrine, just sort of begin a dialogue there. Um, I have um, some questions, I'm sure Rita's, and, and if any come through on the, on the Q&A, we'll be sure to read them. Um, we'll be sure to read them in, but we wanted to open up a space if you guys wanted yeah, to begin by responding to each other. Hi. Um, yes, so I mean, maybe, maybe it's a very technical question, but was this a, a Supreme Court rule overturned eventually, or is it still, like, does it still rule the, because it's kind of like uh, play labor? Uh, no, I mean, I think that's the, precisely the issue, how you can update decisions like these to current conditions of labor online, you know, so it works as a reference, but doesn't work as a, um, as a, it's, it's just a recommendation and kind of uh, mm -hmm. unpacking a, a situation, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think the difficult now, especially when it comes to online labor is to define what labor is, you know? So when I even proposed to shift there was, in the end of the day, the hard part is to now, is when you come to legislation of labor, it, it's very important maybe to, to the issue maybe is to define what's labor, you know, in the end of the day. And I think this is, uh, that has been a challenge for many, like, um, I don't know, nation states or le legislation in general in many countries, because mechanical Turks, especially, or other tasks or micro tasks websites, they work globally, you know. So also is mm -hmm. a nation unless like workplace unregulated. So mm -hmm. it's very difficult to, yeah. Mm -hmm. And also, it seems like to, to, to function on the assumption that labor should not be pleasant, it has because you cannot enjoy yourself or play and consider it labor somehow. And also, something that I noticed during your presentation in the different texts is that a lot of people were talking about how firemen were heroes. And if you like notice some kind of like, um, uh, I don't know, way to frame the problem based on the fact that they consider firemen to be heroes or to be doing hero heroic work. And how does that, um, I don't know, relate to the way they, they make the argument for or against uh, the Supreme Court ruling? Yeah, no, that's true. But also I think sometimes, although I was trying to, I mean, some people really elaborate the questions and I feel sometimes there is a certain engagement that is very genuine with the, the process. In the sense that so you can see some people took their time. I mean, others, that I can feel there is some copy and paste. If you Google, you can easily find some big excerpts that are copy and paste. And then the beginning and the end is kind of the opinion itself. Mm -hmm. But uh, somewhat also you have to go against the clock to these kind of jobs. Because when I was there, like you kind of have to get it done as fast as you can. So you kind of have to give an opinion now. but. You know, not, not because there is a limit time that I impose it, but because you can, other people might get the, your job, you know, and keep it from you. So, because it works almost like an action, uh, auction, you know, so I think the rushiness of the opinion might be seen there. And I think this is a common sense to think of firefights and heroes, perhaps, and like, it's, it's like a moral thing also, right? This heroic thing. So, but uh, yes, and um, if I can, can I ask you something, Sandrine? Yeah, sure, of course. I mean, uh, I was just wondering, especially when I finished with this idea of the automaton, we talked a bit about this. So uh, I don't know if my project is doing that, but like I'm trying to look at these conditions, but um, 
maybe by not uh, raising, not showing the faces of these participants or like, and the participants themselves didn't want to show their names. And um, I was just wondering when you, you did your, when you were talking about your first project, this idea of bringing these people from invisibility to visibility, like mm -hmm. how you think mm -hmm. you, this could be done, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we, we talked about how this last slide was also a good illustration of uh, the moves that this article that I wrote uh, is making by, you know, this kind of like unveiling and um, revelation of like some kind of uh, um, certainly unpaid, but also an uh, anonymous labor uh, mm -hmm. in some ways. And, um, but we also talked about how, how is that enough to like just uh, offer uh, this like kind of revelation uh, if how do you act upon that revelation and how can you um, well you can't say solve the problem I guess of an, uh, an invisible label like that but you know how can this also be translated into a real real actions um, and that's why in my in, in the end of the, my article I end up by asking what should we do about this um, piece by Barry, should it keep, should it, you know, be shown again? Should it be shown in different uh, uh, circumstances with a different maybe curatorial fr framework or something, uh, which, which would be some kind of um, form of um, maybe reparation, I don't know. But it's, there's, no, there's, no, there's no easy answer to, the, to this question. So I'd be curious to hear also what other uh, people think. I don't know if you have, I am, um, I'll just ask quickly, or well, as we, we don't have anything in the chat, please again, feel free to put into the Q&A any questions you might have. Um, as, as you were both speaking, I was thinking about one of the one of the overlaps you seem to have was a kind of a, both doing kind of archival research and what it means to look at an archive and, and wait for meaning, the idea that a text kind of has some kind of meaning and we're waiting for it to arrive. and. Um, and you know, there's really negative ways that can go. And when Felipe was talking about the constitution, we have so much of the way that um, a certain segment of the legal profession views meaning as something that's kind of written. And it's, um, we just have to kind of, we, we're not waiting, it's stuck there. And we just kind of interpret what already happened. Um, and this idea that you would be waiting or bringing things into the present and changing and transforming them. And I was really curious, as you guys do your work in different genres, but both mixing fiction and um, artistic practice and, and archival research, how you thought about your, your role in um, this process of waiting for meaning or how, as we wait for meaning, what we can do to kind of bring these meanings forward or change or, or transform them and, and how you saw that in your practice. Mm -hmm. I tried to make that question as abstract and difficult as I could. <laughs> but I was really just interested in this, pro you know, how you kind of thought about digging in the archive and, and where, where you yeah. saw your role as. In, in, in yeah, I mean, I think that's the whole, that's the whole question, I guess, uh, because, I mean, I guess when you're, or maybe it's just, just a testimony, testimony of my own um, uh, experience uh, in grad school or something, but I feel like I have, I did not get a really good training about what it means to write history and like your own position uh, in, in role and in, in why do we do that? I mean, is it just out of sheer, um, you know, curiosity, interest, personal passion for something? And I, I think there's, it's much more obviously complicated, complicated than this. And so, you know, try, trying to familiar, familiarize myself with uh, all of the discourses uh, which have been going on for many, many centuries about the, um, the what, what does it mean to write history and what is our, what do we do when we do that? And especially uh, when we are, um, uh, you know, for, for instance, Western or European and, and Shaka Bharti uh, talks about, you know, this idea of like inequality of ignorance also in that book, Provincializing Europe, where he says that Western scholar, we can, uh, you know, produce work in, um, Relative ignorance of uh, non-Western history, but that it's uh, it's not the, the reverse is not possible, uh, and so that's really uh, struck me, and so it's something that I'm now thinking a lot about and how 
I mean, I don't think you can ever overcome it, but how do you work with that problem or issue or how do you navigate it? I think on my side, uh, maybe you haven't really felt that when, I mean, this idea of the open call, basically what I did was a kind of open call. And I think the meaning transforms in this waiting time because as soon you get answers, you start thinking, oh, this is a really good one. And then the next one come and then kind of you, open up for new perspectives. But I think that was more striking for me is was what took the expectation towards. I think Waiting has expectation, obviously, but who would submit those things, you know? And I think I come to realize, although this platform doesn't work in all the countries, they keep changing who can work on it. Uh, what I did was also not, uh, you can put restrictions. So the restriction was, Everybody can answer this task, but doesn't, you cannot be from the US. Your computer cannot read it. So I was also thinking like reversing this, the role of like, uh, so people basically from around the world are commenting a Supreme Court case, basically in this participatory thing, this trial, internet trial I proposed. And I think it was surprising to see where people were submitting those images from. And like, uh, because I think, it, it also like, it was from all over and a lot of from Europe, East Europe, and then a lot from India, a lot from Brazil actually, and Latin America and, uh, but like, yeah, I think it's just this transformation of meaning during waiting because depends the order things come, you know, so it feels like things change. And, and also we talked about, you know, like the, um, and also another overlap between our, our project is this kind of like uh, acknowledging of um, how meaning and knowledge is collaborative and how, uh, you know, this notion of authorship of single authorship is a little antiquated and needs to be also maybe resought or, um, I don't know, shuffled or something because uh, you do not think by yourself. And you when even when you write something and you put, you know, you're the actual author, you actually not really are. You always depend on other people's text and other, you know, discussion like this. Uh, there's always some kind of collaborative um, aspect. And I think your project makes this uh, part very tangible by having, you know, using all of these different people. Yeah, yeah. It just, uh, maybe I'll see myself as an editor or something. I don't know. It's difficult even to find the names for this, but mm -hmm. I, I thought then of co-authors. I don't know how this will manifest in the magazine itself, but this is kind of a source of perhaps that will be the work, you know, the photo and the text, but yeah. We actually have a few uh, questions or thoughts, which are totally germane to your conversation right now. Um, it seems like a couple are addressed to Sandrine, so I might just read out two of the questions together so, and, um, and then we'll take it from there. So um, Catherine Wong says, really interesting to think about how all of Sandrine's questions for her fictional conversation could or should also be applicable to historians when they're writing history. Do you think that your fictional conversation is less real or valid than writings that we think of and teach as history, especially without ways to confirm that his history actually occurred the way that it is written. Um, and, and which sort of feels very related to what you were both talking about just now. And I also wanted to read Bethany Ides. Hi, Bethany. Um, Bethany Ides's um, question or comment. And thinking about the waiting room as an intersection or traffic space that the movement through is delayed, but moving nonetheless, and how this space is subject to so many conditions beyond the occupants therein. So wondering what sorts of conditions Sandrine maybe sees already affecting the movement of herself and her presumed interlocutor in the passing, how might the intersection waiting room expect their meeting? These are complicated. <laughs> and how might it recall the traces <laughs> of that meeting later. Um, uh, but maybe, I mean, this is a lot, but maybe you can yeah. pick some part of it. To uh, talk about. No, it's interesting to, to think about the waiting room as a place of traffic space, because I would think the opposite, that's a, a space where you do not move. You're kind of like stuck and you're, you're somehow 
waiting in stillness because you cannot move until somebody tells you to go somewhere or something happens. So you're not really, I mean, yes, there is a lot of, I mean, again, it depends what kind of waiting room, but there might be a lot of people entering and, and leaving the, the waiting room. But I would think more of, of, of of yeah, of a space of um, uh, of stillness, um, and uh, the move. I mean, I'm trying to see also uh, the traces of the meeting. Also, that's interesting. Um, how yeah, how the traces of that meeting in the waiting room. I guess is that uh, she's trying to tell me. Uh, could be captured. Um, that's a really good point. I don't. I don't have an answer to that question, but that's really something I could, yeah, definitely spend more time thinking about. And one of the thoughts I had when you were Sandrine asking that question at the end: what what waiting room and what are what are they waiting for? Mm -hmm. um, like a kind of uh, one thought I had was uh, sort of like comparing and contrasting. The waiting room of history with the angel of history um, mm -hmm. where the angel of history is always moving kind of backwards mm -hmm. with history unraveling whereas the waiting room we imagine as being still mm -hmm. um, i also think of the way in which when deepa shakaburthy talks about um, i guess the way different histories are treated um, some kept in the waiting room that what people are waiting for is the present often mm -hmm. that in a way the present becomes the purview of certain places and certain cultures whereas others are relegated mm -hmm. um, to the past um, mm -hmm. it also made me think of how the this the turk the amazon uh turk that there are certain kinds of jobs that are done while you're at another job you know there's the kind of the when when the fireman is waiting for the alarm to ring, now the fireman is on Amazon making like a cent a second. So there's this sort of like temporality that feels in, in both of your projects, like kind of out of sync, like a kind of a present and a past that are like rubbing up against each other or something. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's interesting. Yeah, uh, I've, I think I've, I've I've also seen this before. This idea of uh, uh, some cultures are belong to the past and relegated to the past, and some other can inhabit the future. So the future is not for everyone; it's only for uh, the one who are allowed to act upon or like do something that allows them to uh, be belong in the future. But uh, some culture can yeah cannot expect ex 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 escape the past. And maybe the waiting room is that past. I don't know. I'm still, I'm still unsure what this waiting room is going to be. <laughs> we'll see. What, what for me was fascinating in my case was like uh, some of the answers I have. Uh, people really talking about how waiting of the firefighters should be compensated, and uh, somewhat I was wondering how one the how this same person perceived themselves during the turk you know like that's what you're saying so maybe when you're talking about something you can clearly see but maybe it's not self-reflected in your own condition so apart from one person that wrote uh, clearly about it i think that was this thing we were talking about like the present looking back maybe you have this perspective but while I don't know, most of, I cannot say, but for some of the answers, they were really eloquent towards, no, no, this should be compensated. Of course, waiting should be compensated. And like, so that was what I was wondering, actually, what were behind the lines, you know, because there is this anonymous also condition to it. Have, um, there's a comment here, um, and it's directed to, to Sandrine, but I think it, really speaks to, to both of you as well, from Luis Faez. Um, your project made me think about the messiness and interdependence of innovative thinking and creating art. Sometimes I think the artist goes out and gets exposed to many different aspects of the world until suddenly, maybe years later, an impression that has been waiting somewhere inside them emerges and influences a theory or an artistic work. So every art piece stands alone as a unique creation, but also represents an anthology of ideas pieced together and interpreted in a unique way. It would be fascinating to trace the lines of influence and see how that 
awareness changes the way someone engages with the creation, oops, this page, um, changes with the creation itself. Um, I, I don't know if you were, I, I just thought it was quite the, this idea of, um, um, it's, there's a line uh, from, from Gramsci that Edward Say quotes very famously in uh, Orientalism talking about the, trying to get at the infinity of traces that are, are, are that have constituted him and his knowledge um, and what that means for kind of how we understand and interpret the world. And I think some of this archival work is, is really, I think the question gets at um, the, the, the dangers in that, right? That someone like Sadie's tracing, but also I think the creative potentials that I see both of you guys um, pulling mm -hmm. out and, and bringing together. Yeah, and I, and I think it's a problem as long as you think about it, I mean, as a, in terms of originality, you know, like uh, if you think that something has to be original, I mean, does something really original ever exist? I don't know, I don't think. That's a very, you know, uh, way of, or productive way of thinking about stuff because, I mean, as long as, as if you start investigating all the traces, yes, you will find that nothing. But it's not, then it's, yeah, then nothing is original, everything is original. So yeah, as, I don't know how, how to think about, um, to, yeah, I, I'm, yeah. This question of originality, I think is tied to this idea of, yeah, finding traces or not finding traces, not making sense, but it's okay. <laughs> There's this uh, uh, question from Natalie that I, again, I feel is like relevant to both of you. And she's talking about how um, Marcusa neglected to sort of maybe talk about the difference between intellectual labor and other kinds of labor, let's say. Um, and she's talking and in response to you, Sandri, and she says, I know she's touched on this issue as one she's thinking about love to hear more about what she thinks about think what she thinks justice or reparations looks like when it's a matter of intellectual labor mm -hmm. is justice a matter of rewriting history like putting footnotes um, in future editions of Marcus's essay or as she said a curatorial text that acknowledges this with Robert Barry's piece I mean which also which I'm really interested to hear and I'm also thinking in terms of Felipe's mm -hmm. piece like this kind of using this Amazon function to make people do intellectual labor. I'm sort of curious what you feel about it. Yeah, and I think it's interesting because Felipe's uh, participants didn't want wanted to remain anonymous for his piece. They didn't want to be named or, I mean, credited beside, you know, the uh, money that they would make. So yes, it's interesting that you know, they refuse, they refuse that right. But um, for, uh, for Marcuse, actually, in the, so in the article, I also make a comparison. I mean, I discuss all of that because I looked in the book at how it discusses other cultural uh, uh, figure. Uh, is it only uh, black activists that are, that remain on name or is it everybody in the text? Because I think you can only make a case for this kind of like uh, epistemic injustice if different speakers or different thinkers are treated differently in his text. And they are, some are named, some are not named. And uh, every time he talks, he talks about um, uh, black people, he talks about, Black people in general. He never names the activists. He never names the musician. He mentions them, but he's not like identify, ident identifying them. And you, when you think, when you also look at what kind of you know uh, liberation movement he's uh, discussing, it's you know it's May '68. It's France. It's not. Uh, while you know at as at the very time there was so many other uh, things happening in the world that he could have used in his um, essay. So there is a different of treatments in the actual text. And I don't have a really good answer to how, how would, you know, uh, repar reparation looks like uh, with uh, intellectual labor. I, I feel like, first of all, yes, of course, uh, uh, people should be credited, credited uh, for their idea, but is that enough? Um, I think it's, it's a beginning. It's a bare minimum probably. So it's probably not enough. Yeah, on my side, just quickly, I just think I've been thinking about like how we thought maybe the internet would have this emancipatory potential that we could have, we could speak, everybody could speak eventually, you know, but then we found ourselves in this situation where you don't know the this kind of the source of the information doesn't matter anymore. So I was thinking Supreme Court, basically the place where the specialists are of law. 
And then I was thinking like, so if we are all specialists now, we can comment on everything. So I think this trial structure is something maybe I try to respond to that. And we even talked to Sandrine, now it's too late to, but I had two films in mind when I was doing this project that is Bamako and the first case, second case from Kiarostami. So, and yes, those films also have this trial structure and sometimes with specialists and the Bamako especially is more like, a, this setting on the backyard where there's a trial to the IMF and the World Bank in Mali, I think, is the film was shot, yeah. And, and that also, I mean, make me think about this other question we had earlier about uh, what, is the, what is the role or what is my role? And so, and with this kind of articles, when I discuss about it, make it sound like we are as, you know, our historian or historians, we become the, the judge. Uh, and we, we have this kind of like, you know, we're making a case against someone for, uh, you know, a uh, uh, case of, uh, yeah, viola violation of intellectual labor or something like this. And so I wonder also if that can, I mean, be because this work is needed, but what does it mean for us? Does it mean that we become also, you know, like the judge, but also, uh, what do you say, the, the one that uh, uh, prosecutes or something, and that you also give the sentence at the end. Um, uh, so that's also something that I was wondering uh, in terms of like, what is our role as historian too? And how that relates, I mean, because obviously in the US there is such a big pressure right now on the uh, you know, justice system and policing. And so do we become, police ourselves, or, you know, are we becoming also a part of some kind of like, um, yeah, part of the justice system in some ways? I don't know. There are um, <laughs> very good and, and big questions and it would be lovely if we were, we were together, we could keep going. We have, um, we're a little bit over time, but maybe there's two more questions in the chat and if everyone is okay, I'll, I'll put them onto the table and, and people can respond. Um, one is a practical question. I think especially these days with everyone so kind of displaced and dispersed um, matters in, in an extra way, but it's a bit, you know, very straightforward. With your work, research is so important. How do you organize it? Is it digital? Is it paper? You know, how do you, um, as you're going through all these archives, going through these mechanical Turks, like what processes are you guys using to synthesize, hold your information together, keep it together? Um, and then a final question directed to Felipe, but again, open here. Um, would like to hear your thoughts on the collectiveness of waiting for the gig worker beer money labor you are working with yeah and this maybe picks up on Sandrine what you were just saying if there's other forms of solidarity and resistance you've observed or thinking about for these platforms well I think like the although these forums are very important and I think they kind of create a sort of shared knowledge about like conditions of labor in different plat cross platforms. The Amazon Mechanical Turk is just one of them. There are so many. I think in the end, what I mean, what a lot of people have been talking about, maybe this is helpful, but in the end, we, we should, workers should create their own cooperatives, you know, towards like they create their own Uber or they create their own, like, uh, like really to run these digital apps or whatever, by themselves. I think perhaps that's the only solution. The cut is really huge, you know, when you do these things in Amazon or any other platforms. And in the end of the day, perhaps, although these forums or solidarity is important, the end, the cooperative is maybe the practical solution for all this, I guess. Um, other possibility, and then the first question I forgot, Avi, but um, I was, uh, sorry, maybe Sandrine can go on. Uh, I think it was about the collectiveness, a uh, form of solidarity. Uh, you know, among a question just about organ organization um, uh -huh. yeah, and how you how you kind of keep yourselves together, perhaps especially these in these times. Uh, but maybe this is too big. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I just save stuff. <laughs> <laughs> And I try to remember where I don't know. I don't have a I don't have a particular uh, you know method to my. No, I, I don't know. I don't know. This is so like random. <laughs> but I've been getting books that I was reading. Now I've been going to to I print this PDF, but I'm not reading the screen anymore. So I've been carrying these things around, and 
uh, feels like a mistake, but I could not deal with the screen anymore. I don't know if I answered the question, but I feel so stupid because I'm so heavy now, but I've been printing all these PDFs because I could not deal, but um, how organize these things? Like, wow, well, I, really, I really don't know. It's, it's, it's messy, you know, I think this, I mean, because I think I see a lot of my works is really about, I feel myself more like producer than perhaps uh, creating something. And I think I'm used to these situations of production somewhat and uh, just organizing things, just connecting things. And I think for me, this is a pretty smooth operation as like basically, I mean, I'm not only do this, but I almost just move things around perhaps, you know, somewhat. I think in the end of the day. So I think I'm used to that somewhat. You know. Well, I think it's um it's interesting because you know, I, I as a teacher, I teach kind of first year students how to research and, and write papers, you know, like um and I, I think often we skip over these really practical steps, like, yeah, what do you do once you have a PDF and how do you mark it up and how do you make sure? I mean, the number of things I lose and have to reread and re-annotate, it's a bit maddening. Um, so I, I was kind of throwing that out there. Maybe you guys have a mystical system that, that brings this all together. Um, uh, but <laughs> thank you both so much um, for, for presenting and for speaking with us. Thanks to the audience for, for being with us tonight. And again, to all the organizers, people um, behind the scenes here. Um, I think these are both really rich, um, rich, and, and evocative um, explorations of kind of how to do this work around waiting um, and thinking through its meanings and its depth and the places we, we may not suspect it. Um, so let me say that the next session will promise to offer much of the same um, uh, excitement and, and engagement and it will be on November 12th with Mustafa Faruqi and Camila Janan Rashid. Uh, we hope you will be able to join us November 12th um, and again, just thanks to Felipe and Sandrine for these uh, wonderful presentations. Um, good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.